actually I'm recording right now. Dr. Mike Watson is a curator, art critic, and a theorist. Uh, you did your PhD on Adorno and his concept of the shutter as it relates to conceptual art. You've been teaching communication into American schools in Italy uh, recently, and you used to be a curator uh, collecting all sorts of political art before being disillusioned with the art world. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. That's that's good. Um, I mean, I am. I, I guess I'm a, a curator, a, an occasional curator, but have been trying very hard to leave the art world for for about two years or longer. Um, but you know, when you're kind of very much in a field, then you you have trouble leaving because that's where your kind of it's where your work's coming in. I mean, fundamentally, I believe in art. Uh, it's just I'm finding more and more of what's interesting happening online and not happening. Um, not happening in, in like the art space uh, and when I see good stuff online it's rarely called art so I think that's interesting because you see good stuff online you see kids who make good stuff and they're really like they're really like um, walking around you know with this kind of like arrogant or you know self uh, interested um, uh, posture you know whereas in, in the art world people you know they have a they have a little exhibition and they have an opening they invite people there's something about the whole setup which is oriented towards people feeling special. I, and I suppose art is about being special. That, that's the kind of thing that gives art power is like, you call something art and you're kind of like, you're kind of like uh, cordoning it off from the world. You're kind of like framing it off and you're kind of putting a special attention on that thing, that object and making it more than just uh, a simple object, kind of quasi spiritual which I think is useful in, in, to an extent, but I think it's, it can be problematic anyway. And I kind of like the, the, the thing of people just making stuff in a kind of punk, punkish way. Or like when I was at art college, we used to make Xerox fanzines and it was all very raw, you know? So yeah. I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of into that and I'm seeing the potential, that kind of potential in meme culture. Yeah, um, I think your main point about what you disliked about the art world you mentioned um how all artistic production in the mainstream and like entertainment production is going to be supporting the values of the ruling class um and it was a very bourgeois space i mentioned something i was trying to remember from baudrillard about how the value um and like the way that art is exchanged on the art market is completely fake um, and just a way to create like value from the status of of being wealthy is exciting how um, the possibility of democratization opening up new ways for people outside of that world to create stuff and it's one of the, that's the main point I suppose of the book is that there's this thing in the art world w w which maybe could offer like some some way out of, of some of the social problems we have this book uh, I wrote in I released in November with zero books called can the left learn to meme, um, which is being shown now. So yeah, um, you know, my main point is that the, you know, in line with Theodore Adorno, German philosopher of the last century who died in 1969, in line with his assertions that art has some potential in 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 showing us a way out of a kind of objectified reality, but very limited potential. I kind of say, well, that potential which may have existed in a very limited form now doesn't seem to exist uh, even in the art world because it's been so far co-opted by capital. You say tragicomically the millennial generation, lacking the utopian vision of many of its modernist forebears, partakes more than any other previous generation in the avant-garde dream of democratization of creative output and reception. You know, there, there is leeway to, to kind of create ruptures in, in the existing system. And I kind of, in a very Adornian way, because Adorno was deeply negative in his thought for probably good reasons, say that there isn't maybe a, you know, a simple way out through, through meme culture, through left meme, left wing meme culture. But the simple repetition of producing stuff uh, in a way that gives us hope. Um, I guess that's the, the kind of ending message of the book. Later you say on the question of what would Adorno think about this kind of meme culture? Capitalism has corrupted society as to make a mockery of leftist theory, so the question is no longer one of whether we have the tools to critique the worst excesses of capital, like Auschwitz. It's one of whether we even care. Today, one might ask if it's possible to read Adorno without stopping periodically to look at cat names. There are people who really like this predicament and people who hate it, but whether the state of today's visual culture makes you want to laugh or cry, it is quite clear that the internet has usurped the art world as a space for free expression and experimentation.
Though an unprecedented level of freedom regarding the production and reception of the image may not be a defense in itself of the content being shared. In fact, Adorno had something rather disparaging to say about the jokey images displayed in popular media formats that may be of relevance today. Quoting him, they amount to the throwing of all meaning overboard like a ballast in the snapshot of the situation and the unresisting subjugation to the empty hegemony of things. The state of the art joke is the suicide of intention. So that makes me think that he might be pretty angry at some of the um, the comedy and the nihilism in, uh, in meme culture. He was a Jew uh, exiled from Nazi Germany. Um, and you mentioned his line about how you know, whether it's possible to make poetry after the atrocity of Auschwitz and really talking about, um, is there a place for art and expression uh, now that we've experienced like the uh, extreme of the cruelty under capitalism? Yeah, I mean, that's probably Adorno's most famous line. I think it was in 1947 in, in an essay in the anthology called Prisms. And he said it in 1961 in an essay called Commitment, uh, where it's possible to make lyric poetry or poetry after Auschwitz, although he really means art anyway, in the broadest sense. Then later on in the essay, he says, we need to, we need to keep making art in any case as a refusal to surrender to cynicism, to capital uh, as such. Um, and I think this is very interesting. It's what I pick up on in the book as being perhaps the one sense in which millennials and we could say Zoomers as well are Adornian uh, in that I see in, in meme culture, even in selfie culture, this kind of tendency to, because you see the cynicism, definitely a tendency to assume that we're all deeply screwed, but then to make stuff anyway. And that making stuff anyway kind of resists the objectification because you are, yeah, okay, we're all essentially reified, um, made into material um, by the capitalist machine. But as long as we keep producing creatively, we're kind of fantasizing a way out because images as such, creative production is a kind of fantasy, uh, is a kind of illusion. So, you know, we can delude ourselves somehow into temporary kind of freedom. There are things you like about Adorno needing to continue making art in the face uh, of this pessimistic outlook and then your dislike of his cultural elitism, especially his obsessive hatred with jazz. What is that about, by the way? Like, what is so bad about jazz? Um, if you're a it's a good question that hasn't really been answered. People say different things. There, there are like different extremes. There, there is the accusation even that, that Adorno could be racist, um, and that an element of jazz music is African. But there was a kind of degenerate art, um, and it was connected to a culture of like, this is a place where black people would go into a kind of safe space and then create art outside of like the musical and artistic traditions of the mainstream. And, you know, there were drugs happening and... Well, I mean, Adorno was kind of a big party head, I think, and he's not very well known. I don't, I don't know much about this. Is When I was studying him during my master's and doctorate, and I was really thinking I need to be like somehow a very sensible guy and not partying because I'm studying, you know, I'm trying to understand this bloody philosophy, which is extremely hard to get your head around um, when, you, when you're first trying. And then I learned actually after like some period of like really trying, you know, to somehow behave, um, that he actually was really into parties. And, and uh, I mean, he's seen as this very uptight guy. We're not sure how much uptight he was, but in his own communities. But I, I think this is tricky because there's nothing in his work that suggests really racism. He was an exiled German Jew, exiled from Germany when it became impossible to teach there, first to Oxford and then to America. And so, I mean, a lot of his writing is really dealing with, with that racism and he, a lot of his theory is dealing with that and how capitalism got so far that it wasn't just like identifying objects or rationality in enlightenment, post-enlightenment, the post-enlightenment world as such, wasn't just identifying, categorizing objects so as to control them. It ended up so it's identifying, categorizing other humans so that we all became part of a numbers machine. And that made it possible for the racism of uh, the Nazis to end in the death camps. But, you know, actually, if you look at what he's saying, he talks about this thing called uh, jitterbugging, which was a popular dance craze at the time linked to jazz. And I don't know what the dance exactly went like, but um, the jitter, a jitterbug is a type of bug that kind of moves around erratically. 
Mm -hmm. um, and he said that, you know, if these people would spend less time trying to be jitterbugs and more time trying to be humans, we'd be in a better position. Uh, which again, I suppose you could, could call racist, but he was simply meaning that this this mass media kind of dance craze that came down through radio and, and the mass media recording industry um, was dehumanising people in the sense that mass media as such was dehumanising people. So I think he was really just seeing jazz as he was seeing TV and film. And he never had anything good to say about TV and film. The other thing is his, his disdain for his students when they... They started uprisings in 1969, so basically a continuation of the uprising sweeping through Europe, um, which you know we mostly know through the 1968 passive, the Paris, sorry, 1968 Paris uprisings. Um, so there were these big uprisings in Frankfurt and across Germany in, in 1969. In Frankfurt, led by one of his PhD students, so kind of awkward, and he refused to back them. And he said, among other things, I don't want to write apologies or excuses for your petrol bombs um, but his thing was he just didn't think that one could immediately create a movement that was going to overturn uh, the social problems of the time or political problems of the time because he believed that fundamentally we were thinking wrong uh, humans are constrained to think through what he calls identity thinking which means that we as I kind of hinted at before we to protect ourselves we tend to identify we tend to look at things and categorize them to make them safe for us and that ends with us categorizing, categorizing as i said before each other under a kind of numerical count or, or wages um so he says as long as we think this way you know whatever revolution we're going to have is going to degenerate into totalitarianism it's unavoidable um so that's basically why he wouldn't back his students so again i think on his terms, this kind of makes sense, but deeply unpopular. But I think, you know, one has to look at the fact that Adorno was writing after everything had gone really, really wrong. You know, it's, it got to the situation where, where we're fearful of getting again today through the, the rise of the populist, the populist right. So he's thinking of it from a different angle to us. So I, I don't think that that means we shouldn't protest because we're at a different stage. Well, I agree. Um, like his point about jazz at least being becoming a mass-produced cultural object as part of his point about the culture industry, um, like flattening out media and making people complacent and thoughtless under uh, democracies. I think it's kind of parallel to some conversations we have about things like cultural appropriation, the commodification of things like uh, hip-hop music, which began as um, like a very co politically conscious culture and is now a very mainstream thing that a lot of, you know, rich white uh, music executives profit from and has and maybe has lost some of that potential. And it's also similar to the concept of recuperation from the situationists where they say that things that are supposedly radical um, and the imagery that is like set up as an antithesis to the status quo become absorbed by liberalism and has that potential stripped away and then they become a way to reinforce the status quo. Without fully understanding his critique of jazz, I could see how um, something in that vein makes sense to me. Well, this is interesting actually, because he was, he was almost entirely negative about, about the culture industry. So basically this term he introduced in the book Dialectic of Enlightenment, which he co-wrote with Max Horkheimer, Media theory, as such, what we the kind of the kind of lowest common denominator media theory that we that we employ today, is very much influenced by Adorno and also Walter Benjamin. And, and basically, I think we we tend to just go, yeah, the media is made by the elites to control the masses. So I think when we when we look at um, what's happening today, you know, we tend to today go, well, okay, well, this is really what's happening with Facebook, and this is what's happening, you know, because these these platforms, although relatively free to use by the user, in terms of financial sense, and, and although offering the user endless choices, um, they're still run by the elite. Uh, so we must be in the same situation. But I, I find that unfulfilling because if Adorno is saying, um, look, you know, whether you have films, TV, whatever. Uh, in America, the, the idea of being peddled that one one has one has you know choices that one does not have 
in fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, you know, it doesn't hold true because all the choices are between basically the same message, that you have a choice between several Hollywood films and the cinema, but they're all reinforcing um, a similar worldview. If that is Adorno's complaint, one can only assume that he would have seen meme culture and social media as much better than, you know, TV and, and film and magazines. Um, so I wonder if we're mistaken in directly applying people like Adorno and even Baudrillard and Sontag uh, to, to today's culture. And we, I think we have to take something positive away from the huge leaps we've seen since. Right. Um, but there's a really interesting aspect in the book where in the essay on the culture industry and the dialect dialectic of enlightenment, where um, Adorno says that, you know, the, the culture industry, the, the, the mass produced products of the culture industry are making us both more intelligent and more stupid at once. So simultaneously more intelligent and more stupid. And what I find interesting there is the more intelligent aspect, because if, as I think today is definitely the case, um, with meme culture, you know, if media is making us cleverer, smarter, somehow sharper in, in some respects, yet more stupid, we can't ignore the smarter part. You know, there is some aspect in which we're becoming, especially if you talk to like young millennials or Zoomers, I mean, they're super sharp, I think, compared to Generation X at, at the same age. Not to keep making the mistake of trying to imagine what Adorno or Baudrillard would think about things today, um, but at least seeing if these analytical tools, what we can make of them. He has a concept of the shutter, which as I understand it, is moments that effective art makes you be in an, an emotional, thoughtful place of thinking about an alternative. And it's like the curtains have been pulled back and you see things as they really are for a second. Do you think that memes can be politically effective in that way? That's a pretty good description. I mean, the, 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 the shudder is like a momentary shock uh, via, for Adorno, the abstract artwork, which kind of breaks us out of our, our, our normal kind of uh, false way of thinking. So for Adorno, if, if we tend to over-categorize nature and each other, the abstract artwork being beyond categorization, because we can't really see what's happening in an abstract artwork, um, it breaks us out of that, that, that false categorization, that false identity thinking, as he calls it. Um, Meme culture, I mean, this is, this is an issue because actually meme culture tends, to, in a political sense, tends towards identity. By that, I mean the right-wing meme culture, which grew up uh, around the 2016 presidential election, or which, which became very big around that time um, and still continues. And the left-wing meme culture that kind of counteracts that, you know, precisely tends towards categorization, towards like, I am this and you are that. And, and, and Adorno on many levels uh, disrespected this kind of art and actually this whole thing where he said, you know, one cannot make art after Auschwitz. He really was talking about figurative art, the art that plays back into the fundamental problem. That, you know, if, if one paints uh, suffering, one paints somebody being tortured or suffering in warfare or homeless, then you're, you're basically you're identifying them. So the initial problem they're suffering because society tends to identify, categorize people uh, to such an extent that people are exploited. In the painting of them, you're repeating that. Whereas via an abstract image, you're somehow disrupting that and leading to perhaps new new ways of thinking. Um, so the meme culture, you know, the display of swastikas and the kind of white supremacist imagery we see with, with the alt-right does, I think, and quite deliberately repeat the actual problems with society. The left to combat that, I think they can't combat that simply with images of guillotines um, by displaying hammer and sickle. I mean, now what I say is controversial for a number of probably people we even associate with online. For Adorno, I think that the, a, a positive meme culture would have to be an abstract one and not one that plays back into the symbols of, uh, of conflict. What I find, what I feel is that meme culture as such the, the whole of the internet taken you know, as a sum of, of competing images is abstract because one can't, make a sing one can't take a singular message uh, from it. So I think that in itself is enough to disorient. Maybe it's that that can lead us onto new ways of thinking. Yeah, what you say about identity focus makes me worry a bit because I just put out a video literally putting people into different categories of like how people vote in uh, American democratic uh, primary elections. 
And there's this really popular genre of meme making archetypal characters and giving them names. And, you know, this is really proliferated. And then you're supposed to think about people as like, here's this kind of Zoomer, here's this kind of Boomer. Is he talking more about that or or is it more about Like you said, the kind of iconography, I also am like not too pleased with just the kind of performative putting guillotines and hammers and sickles up. Are those both examples or is uh, is it more to do with the um, latter? I mean, you're talking like about Duma and Trad Girl and this this kind of thing, no? Right. These uh, memes. Um, And that video was really interesting. Um, I think there is a critical element. I think it's kind of clear that you're not going along with it entirely. I mean, Adorno's identity thinking is in the broadest sense. So, I mean, the way I would describe it, if I was going to really break it down, is uh, kind of mundane. But, I mean, if you take an apple, and an apple is worth one of something, so let's mm-hmm. just say it's worth one dollar, and you take a car, and the car's worth a thousand dollars, you know, this is kind of very reductive, because a car is not a thousand apples. You know, so... so is ident- identifying for Adorno is not adequate to reality. Um, but what he really means by it is, is just that it's a tendency, you know, to simplify things uh, for the ease of exchange and the ease of living. But it goes right back to primordial times. So, it, you know, before even money exchange, you're talking about, uh, okay, so you're, you're frightened of the, the, the elements, the wind and the rain. Um, you know, all these things must have been kind of terrifying to people who also because, you know, they weren't, large-scale buildings to measure stuff against so everything probably seemed much bigger so a, a completely gray sky or tumultuous kind of um a thundery sky would have been something probably to fear um and so you know people started to kind of think of god so there's a thunder god and there's a sun god this is the beginnings of identification and you kind of you stave that off by magic rituals uh, then by greek myth then by religion then by capitalism uh, these are all kind of successive stages of, um, or by capitalism, by, by rationality, should I say, by post-enlightenment thinking. These are all stages of, of identifying simply of categorizing things to make humans feel more comfortable. The principal kind of identification being between oneself as what we call in philosophy the subject and everything else being the object. And for Adorno, this is mistaken because we are not actually different from the object. We are, as long as we try and flee nature fundamentally for a fear of uh, mortality, which I suppose is very topical in the age of coronavirus. Um, right. You're not going to, you know, you never flee it because we are nature. Um, and for Adorno, the whole point of the shudder uh, in face of the abstract artwork is that one, and he was really into classical music and literature more than painting. Um, so we think of maybe music, but one, one listening to music you know, you get lost somehow, you get suspended somehow when listening to music and you forget your boundaries uh, for a moment. And for him, this was the moment of shudder. Although actually for him, the moment when you come down from that, when you you fall from that temporary suspension is the most useful moment because then then you're like, oh, what happened then? And you realise that something, there's something... um, mistaken in your in your everyday kind of tendency to separate yourself from the outside and he sees that as exemplary for how we have a better politics but he never explains or doesn't i don't think he even thinks that there's any way of literally taking that experience of shudder and applying it in the political realm which is where we're always a bit stuck in that sense Mm -hmm. that's a really helpful explanation getting lost in music and like kind of forgetting who you are and the boundaries between you and everything else. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I I suppose it's an ability to be applied in the political realm makes sense in terms of how you, you talk a lot about the power of art and maybe memes or online do it yourself media uh, as a kind of anti-rational dreaming experience. Whereas politics is necessarily like a material uh, conservative, realm of like what is practical what what is what exists and what is being done so there's no way that those can be bridged through Um, like propaganda art or anything like that i mean the the times maybe demand that we we try and use art to push um certain messages um maybe there are ways of doing it um i certainly don't really find myself that i'm very moved by anything though that literally is is saying like do this or do that like um Mm be socialist or or not you know um 
most exemplary of uh, kind of a Dornian stance in meme culture is uh, Vaporwave. Um, right. Because it's largely without hope and it's kind of abstract, it's kind of nonsense. It doesn't really tell you do this or do that. I mean, there's a strong anti-capitalist element, I think, to Vaporwave. Um, but although there's also like Fash Wave and there are other kind of offshoots. Yeah, um, which is like but, Nazi Vaporwave. Yeah, for fascist, fascist wave is fascist wave. But um, I think at its, at its base, it, you know, it was kind of anti-capitalist, but it wasn't really telling you, like, you know, be anti-capitalist or vote this person. Mm -hmm. I supported Corbyn in the UK and I'm following Sanders in the US, but I don't really think I get anything from being told that stuff. And vaporwave somehow, it's kind of meandering and confusing and it somehow agitates you in, into maybe thinking beyond the obvious, I guess. And that's something I find yeah. much more interesting. Yeah, this gives me a lot to think about because sometimes I make videos that are just kind of weird and inscrutable. Um, but a lot of times I do make things that are just propaganda in, in the sense that, I mean, I think that word gets used in kind of a silly way online a mm -hmm. lot. But um, I, mean, I think I, I, I think your stuff is good. I mean, I think the thing is also I've made videos that are very direct and saying do this or do that as well. And I think, you know, again the historical moment kind of calls for it especially when you're talking about elections you know i don't think one can really have much of a useful impact on an election with an abstract painting or yes i agree abstract with piece of music but the election is like very short term whereas i think any real change is coming on a much more long-term scale i think this kind of tanky culture is very challenging because you want to say to a young person who's just picked up marks yeah go for it but on the other hand you don't want to end up in uh some kind of bloody bloody revolution followed by decades of exploitation and then some gulags. Um, you know, I mean, so sometimes I'm meeting young people who are inclined to think that anybody over 30, i.e. boomer, who is saying that maybe that route isn't the best route, is a neolib. Right. Uh, so it puts us, it puts anyone who's more moderate, even if like they're socialists, puts them in a difficult position. I guess maybe me, maybe you find yourself in that position sometimes. I, I agree with what you say there. I also agree with what you're saying about art. I, I think that our political communication should be understood as having a separate role than artistic expression a lot of times. And this is, this is why a lot of performance art doesn't really do it for me. But the political value of art, whatever it is, um, is about the kind of slow incremental change in people's subjectivity in a way that you can't really predict. There are changes in the way that the collective consciousness works happening now that may have been influenced by postmodernism decades ago. So it's not like this, this protest song is going to save this election. As you say, it's a much more long-term thing. Yeah, for sure, yeah. I mean, I think there are quite deliberate kind of abstract type productions happening. I mean, in, in your work, sometimes I see that abstraction or a kind of, kind of messing up a disruption of, of a figurative representation. So you had this um, Indian female MP, I think, member yes, of Mahua Parliament. Moitra. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and and brilliant speech she made. And you you have that speech, which in itself may not have been entirely interesting. I mean, yeah, it would have been, but somehow reproduced in that way, you've made it more to think about than just a speech on its own terms, because you have this kind of like glitch here glitchy type thing or you're adding kind of like effects and colors and somehow making it just more than a programmatic speech so you know yeah. i think i mean that, that is abstracting if you take something that's non-abstract and, and intervene somehow you're you're abstracting to a level i i want to read quickly something that you say about glitch uh in the same conversation as vaporwave you say whereby an image appears to be temporarily both jammed and blurred that can be applied to images and video clips, the jilted effect of the glitch mimicking the failure of the 80s analog technology. For a short time, represented a novel language that embodied both nostalgia for a pre-internet age and a sense that the internet, and by extension wider society, is quote-unquote broken. I think that really explains like what is attractive about glitch aesthetics and vaporwave-inspired aesthetics, too. I suppose I was looking a little bit at why there is this kind of like use of a nostalgic aesthetic um, as well. I know you're not um, focused very much on situationism. It's something I've been thinking about more recently, but do you think that that kind of reproduction of nostalgic, like corporate Muzak, schlocky stuff 
is an example of state tournament. Uh, the the strategy of um, taking imagery within uh, mass media and repurposing it in a way that liberalism can't then take back from you. Um, I think there's parallels, yeah, with um, with situationist strategy of appropriating appropriating the tools of of, of mass media or of social media. Um, it's a bit different, I suppose, because very often we're not even dealing with the mass media anymore. We're dealing with stuff that exists already on the internet. It's like a, it's like a bastardization of existing memes. But yeah, I mean, of mainstream messages. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a similar tactic. But you know, I think we're very keen to look at them and say, okay, that's a good example of of, of what possibly should be happening, um, and less keen to credit um, meme production today as having some disruptive influence. I think it does have a disruptive influence, definitely. But I don't think it's very often because somebody intends to make a socialist or communist meme and that meme disrupts. It's more, again, like a sum total of different yeah. things that are disrupting. Yeah, it's and very cumulative. Really, have you ever seen uh, some stuff I've done, like uh, like almost VJ stuff, techno, what it kind of... what? What I now call theory wave is uh, often say is easier to identify than it is to define. Partly, partly it's uh, it's hard to define because of its. Um... But it just occurs to me that it's kind of up your street in terms of what you're doing. Oh just... yeah, I, I'm excited to check that out. You think that memes in this culture have a limited uh, political use? I I do think that posting is not an alternative to organizing and material stuff. Uh, so I agree with that, but. I'd like to hear your advice for leftist communicators. And I also sent you a meme on Twitter that I made mm -hmm. that I just want to get your opinion. I mean, it's a good question. It's kind of crucial because there's so many people now making left content, which is great. People who make leftist stuff uh, on YouTube, BreadTube, uh, et cetera. Um, Means TV, obviously, and left memers. I mean, there's so much happening. But, you know, there is this fear of uh, people thinking that's enough. I don't get much of that. I get most people asking what more we can do. So it's good you say that. I mean, I think in the in the Labour campaign, which I, I did a little bit for um, the UK election campaign of uh, November, December, there was kind of an example. I mean, there was basically a, a strategy imported from America um, called... Um, dispersed organization which is kind of a sanders movement strategy where you have an online online forum which momentum were running this uk campaign group that work with labor um you have this online forum in which uh, there will be like a section for people who would go uh, campaigning on the streets there'll be a section for uh, people making videos there'll be like a section for people making phone calls and in that you saw a kind of link up uh, where you could say to somebody uh, if you're free, go to this town to campaign, but also try and post a meme video, like a selfie video talking about why you want to vote Labour, uh, maybe saying bad stuff about the Conservatives. Um, this kind of link up between online culture and kind of on the ground campaigning was very positive, although then Labour lost really badly. Yeah. So, But the, the strategy in itself, in terms of thinking of a movement and not simple electoral successes, I think that strategy is is a good one, and some and somehow we need to do that outside elections. The momentum is are carrying on uh, with this kind of strategy. I think they're obviously thinking of where it didn't go entirely right, but you know I don't see why this can't happen anyway. Could there not be in maybe the acid communist community because uh, acid communism is kind of growing uh, as an idea. This is like a term coming from Mark Fisher, basically meaning you know he wrote this before he passed away. Uh, in an introduction to an unfinished book, but basically that we need to grow up a counterculture uh, among the left equal to the hippie and, and, and punk and, and acid house movements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it not possible then to have a forum uh, where you can say to people like, we need more memes on this subject and this subject, um, but also if you're in New York, some happenings around the subject would be useful. In London, happenings around this subject, sometimes the happenings would be around the same subject internationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, we fully have the means to, to make a forum in which we could mass organise internationally and constantly both memes and real life happenings. So I'd really like that to happen. I'm imagining a conversation in the future, people being like, oh, the underground New York memes are so much better than West Coast memes. 
Uh, <laughs> is there already like a geographical breakdown in America of that nature? Yeah, I mean, I have a friend who uh, lived in Mexico for a while who would talk to me about like the meme culture of Mexico. So there, there definitely is a geography to it, although maybe much more flattened out among the English speaking world. The meme is a little tricky to get your head around. It's called the aesthetic horseshoe. Okay. On the far left end, you have like low art, like online do it yourself meme kind of stuff. On the end of high art, you have like fine art avant-garde kind of stuff this mainstream aspect and you're are you saying that mainstream low art as in pop culture and high art they're both conforming to the ruling class ideology yeah i have the example of some dance film festival there yeah sure and then at the other extreme you have low art of a left nature diy and sorry high art of a left nature a uh, ruling class is like at the top of it um, and I say like the potential to uncover alternatives to the status quo. So like potential to be valuable to us is lower. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is, is there a kind of crossover between what low art and high art can accomplish in rejection of the mainstream? Yeah, I think it's interesting. The, I mean, the avant-garde, if you think of, for example, the Dadaists, um, the Cabaret Voltaire, this kind of yeah. club uh, in was it Zurich during World War One, where a number of uh, wealthy artists kind of decamped um, and kind of made crazy cabaret and other performances, um, other kind of forms of performance and games and things, which kind of in its bizarreness, uh, they had these kind of what would later become surreal, surreal kind of cabaret. You know, that it was aimed at disrupting, at critiquing just the the barbaric nature of of uh, World War One and nothing would be making much sense then. And again, times that um, probably seem scarier than our, than our times with millions of people dying uh, in the trench warfare. You know, but then at the same time, these people were, they escaped the war. I mean, they decamped to there to, 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 to hide from the war and made possible by the fact that they were all fairly wealthy, I think. So you do get that kind of aspect of the avant-garde is it um, resistance or is it like uh, uh, basically just one one wing of the elite? And then, then you know, something slightly different, the avant-garde ends up being sold sold off anyway, co-opted, so the, the element that was in any case rebellious because they were kind of telling their own kind of peers that they were, you know, that they were critiquing their own peers and telling them that what was happening was not good, was not on. Um, yeah. But then this stuff gets bought up and put in museums. Uh, so it loses all of its essential value and shock. Like Duchamp, who's a little, a little bit different, but still Dadaist, um, Duchamp's urinals, the fountain piece. And in itself is radical, because you're saying anything can be art, and you're saying this toilet can be art. So you're taking art off its pedestal. But then he, he had six replicas made. So actually when you see it in a museum now, it's one of six replicas. They're mm. all worth a lot of money. Uh, so his original kind of um, shocking act becomes something uniform and, and factory produced yeah. because actually they weren't ready made at that point. They weren't something he took. It was something he had produced. It's kind of close to recuperation. Yeah, exactly. Mind. Yeah. But I think this, the horseshoe here kind of points to that in a way for me that it, that doesn't contradict what's being, what's being said here. And it's a cool kind of meme working aesthetically as well. Just something I threw together thinking probably people smarter than me would tell me what's wrong. But in any case, Dr. Mike Watson, I really loved this conversation. I'll encourage everyone to pick up Can the Left Learn to Meme um, to see your article in Commune magazine called Millennial Adorno, Utopian Pessimism for the 21st Century, in which you give me a shout out uh, very kindly to follow Zero Books and to follow your twitch which is called left can mean so thank anything you. else yeah oh, cheers that's perfect brilliant um thank you for having me on and thank you for your brilliant work and i hope we get to talk more uh, in the future cheers. absolutely stay safe with this virus stuff all right yeah i will do my best thank you